Hello and welcome. They will beat back the efforts of the Thebans to take the hegemony away from them. And when the Macedonians, under Philip II, the father of Alex the Great, beats the coalition of uh, Greek armies at Carinae in 338 BC, the Spartans alone stand in defiance of the Macedonian overlord and actually raise up rebellion after rebellion. And in the third century BC can even generate reform to oppose the Mas Macedonian overlordship um, in Greece. And that is a result of the resilience of those traditions of command, the kind of structure evolved in commanding the Peloponnesian League, and therefore the motto in the Spartan um, uh, alliance system, the Peloponnesian League, is the Allies swore to, to follow the Spartans wherever they went. And that was a motto most of the Allies were more than willing to heed. Lecture 5, The Athenian Democracy. In this lecture, I plan to introduce Athens, uh, her democracy, and also the evolution of that peculiar democratic constitution, which, as I mentioned in previous lectures, was not that particularly popular with most ancient authors. There's two issues I want to deal with in this lecture. First is, how did this democratic constitution come about and become, in effect, the ancestral constitution of the Athenians? The Athenians...
Oh, 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 too high, too I think this is the only way to there, right? We know. That's what it will. We know. Pay the balance if you're two, if you're gonna take a four. Or you get a three, and then you'll face a uh, hard and then it's gonna be. Mm -hmm. I'm not losing with that. Yeah, let's do it right here. Okay. I'll go back to this later. Oh no! You bug? Yeah. Okay. You know what the priest is doing? The corpses are knocked down. Ah! No. Nothing we can find with this. And then, yeah. Um. Really define themselves by their democracy. By the time of the Peloponnesian War, they've been practicing it for three or four generations. This is a remarkable development in and of itself, 
And it goes a long way in explaining why there is this sentimental loyalty to Athens. I share it myself. That certainly goes back to George Grote and to that whole parliamentary tradition. The second point is to give some kind of sketch as to how the democracy actually Honest. operated. Mm -hmm. And what is remarkable about it is it was a direct participatory democracy. Mm -hmm. All citizens over the age of 18 without property qualification had the right to vote. And we have to remove certain notions of our own mm -hmm. sense of the mm -hmm. word democracy, that this was a direct uh, democracy in which the citizens in assembly voted laws and that the assembly was sovereign and there was nothing like a set of checks and balances which is such so much the hallmarks of the american constitution so uh... the athenian constitution in many ways was typical of greek city-states there was an elected set of officials they had replaced the ancient kingship there was a council a boule as it's called at most city-states which is a sense means the will it acted as the steering committee that prepared the business for the assembly that was divided up into a series of ten subcommittees, if you yeah. will, known as a pritnase, pritnase, or pritnase yeah. which would take Pritne. power mm -hmm. each of the one-tenth of the year that the Athenian calendar was divided into. That council was a reflection of the wider citizen body. Fifty members each month, which is about forty days, ten months to the Athenian official year, it was the lunar calendar, they acted as the executive committee to the boule, which is the steering oh. committee, to the full so okay. of citizens. Yeah. Okay, and yeah. then there's the Not the order of the citizens, yeah. and they could yeah. pass any law they wished to pass. There were no restrictions on that assembly. And the assembly, in many ways, met in a judicial capacity as a series of uh, jurors. And so, what is often perplexing to the Athenian assembly, oh, not only to yeah. us, but to many of the yeah. ancient authors, yeah. yeah. was the fact oh. that the demos, that is, all adult free male citizens, had the right to address the assembly, to vote in the assembly, and to expect justice administered by that assembly. Mm, right? So remove oh. the notions of checks and balances. The citizens were really sovereign and had a lot more direct experience in running their government than under any modern constitutional system. Let's start with a comment made by uh, the great uh, statesman Pericles, or we think it was made. Thucydides puts this in a speech of his, of Pericles, in the second year of the Peloponnesian War. It's very often known as the <laughs> and it was Pericles standing forth to explain oh. what the purpose of the, oh. sacrifice of the Peloponnesian War is all about. And he talks oh. about the unique Athenian traditions that are summed up in democracy. Uh, yeah, you know, yeah. it this way. I thought I would be able to heal or at least use uh, her. Now you do it before you go on the horse, that's right. Yeah. It is more the case of our being a model to others than of our imitating anyone else. Our constitution is called a democracy because power is in the hands not of a minority but of the whole people. And the Greek word hall demos means the people in assembly as an orderly group of voters not a hoi polloi, the many, or a mob. When it is a question of settling private disputes, everyone is equal before the law. And when it is a question of putting one person before another in a position of public responsibility, what counts is not membership of a particular class, but the actual ability which the man possesses. No one, so long as he has it in him to be of service to the state, is kept in political obscurity because of poverty. These are powerful words in a Greek city-state and certainly run contrary to most governments in the Greek world in which there was a fundamental belief, the Spartans share it with all their Peloponnesian allies, that the upper classes, the koloi kagathoi, the good and the beautiful is what it means in Greek, had a natural instinct and right to rule. In Athens, while many of the aristocrats did hold positions of authority, the fiction was, the constitutional fiction, that any citizen could address the assembly and ultimately any citizen could aspire to public office. And this was revolutionary stuff indeed for the Greek world and had come to characterize Athenian government by 431 BC uh, at the outbreak of the Peloponnesian War. And it's why all of us feel this very, very strong kinship and identification with the Athenian democracy since the 19th century. Well, the two major huh? issues is how did it come about and how did it function? Athens was, in many ways, in its early developments in the dark and archaic age, that is from 1100 to about 600 BC, really uh, quite behind most city-states. One could call it retarded in its development in many ways. Part of the reason was that Athens had lots of resources. To be sure, the land isn't particularly arable, mm -hmm. but it is well suited for olive trees and vineyards. It's not so good for, for grain. 
It is plentiful in resources such as marble, iron, later uh, very important silver mines. There was a fair amount of timber before the Athenians started deforesting the region. And the Athenians commanded a large hinterland, a kovra as it's called in Greek. Uh, there was the city-state of Athens, but the whole of Attica, a thousand square miles, constituted that city-state. All free residents were Athenians, not Atticans, but Athenians. This was quite different from Laconia, from Boeotia, where Thebes was a city-state, there were ten others, where Sparta was a city-state in Laconia, and the other areas were dependent villages and townships on Spartan polis. So the Athenians had this single polis that embraced a very wide area, and by Greek standards it was very big. In the height of the 5th century yeah. BC, its mm -hmm. population may have been as large as 300,000, which is enormous for a Greek city-state. That's a point that you must keep in mind, that Athens alone was seen as an unusually powerful. Furthermore, the Athenians had a different history than most of the Peloponnesian League. They could claim um, descent from the original inhabitants of the region going back to the Bronze Age uh, because it was not taken over during the so-called Dorian migrations when the Bronze Age kingdoms collapsed. They saw themselves as the mother city, the metropolis, of all the Ionian cities of the islands in the coast of Asia Minor, which is known as Ionia. Uh, that in the breakup of those legendary kingdoms, the Athenians themselves were spared a conquest, and therefore there was not a tradition of a subject population. And this is a very important oh, lesson mm. that came out of the, uh, the mm. end of the Bronze Age. The Athenians said it's because they were so valorous. Uh, Thucydides' comment is, well, the soil of Attica is so poor, why bother conquering it? Uh, ever the pragmatic, pragmatic Thucydides' writing. The result is that when we begin to get information on Athens, and we have particularly good information on the Athenian constitution, and when we get into the 5th and, and 4th centuries BC, an enormous wealth of documentary evidence in the form of public inscriptions, coins, archaeology, in a way that we don't have in most other Greek city-states. But when we begin to get clear information in the 7th century BC, Athens is a typical aristocratic republic. A series of powerful families known as the Eupatridae, the well-born ones, the aristocrats always take the good names, dominated the whole... Yeah, what is it? So...